I'm coming today from Wayne State University. I'm also affiliated with, with the University of Michigan. Uh, I'm an assistant professor of uh, biological sciences at Wayne State, and I'm affiliated with Geriatric Center in University of Michigan. So I will be sort of giving you an overview of everything that we're doing in U of M as well, as well as at Wayne. And we will be basically talking about the brain today and aging, which is something that everybody cares, and obesity, which is also something that everybody cares. You know, some more, some less, but for, to the same, for, to a different extent, but all of us basically. So uh, it will be not very intense, uh, you know, like deep biology, but sort of giving you an overview of what we know and where we are going towards as a field in general, in terms of, you know, being applicable and trying to understand how we are moving from animal models to human and what sort of reality is in it. So let's start. And, you know, this is basically something that obesity researchers are always using when they're showing these graphs, and some of you probably saw it before, and I'm pointing with a knife, so sort of. Anyways, but we all know that obesity is a really major problem in the U.S. Not only in the U.S., of course, but if you will look at this from 1995 to 2010, it keeps going up and up. Numbers are really huge, so it's basically become as an epidemic, and we all know about it, and we just see it on the streets. We know it's a huge, huge mess. And the number of children that are considered to be obese, and they will keep going with this obesity later in life, just keeps going up and up, and the numbers are really crazy. So the major questions in terms of obesity are, how can this overweight and obesity be prevented, right? And also, you know, from biological perspective, who are the major players? I mean, why is it happening? Why is it happening to some of us? Why some, why, we all eat the same junk food, right? But some of us are getting really fat from it, and some of us don't, right? We, and it, it's true that we might eat less, but still, it's the same junk food, it's the same calorie intake, but some of us really get obese and some don't. Why? So the balance, to maintain this balance between energy intake and energy expenditure, there are very many factors that contribute to this. Basically, how many calories we eat and how many calories we're actually burning. And yes, we have the, the, we have the environmental input. It's very important what sort of environment are we living in, the li our lifestyle, and also what we call basically individual predisposition. Because some of us will gain weight from one hamburger and some of us might not. Now, from biological perspective, what is happening is basically, and what we know at this point, is that it's all about the brain. So hormones that are secreted from the blood, like leptin and insulin, that they circulate in a proportion, direct proportion to our body weight and they cross the blood-brain barrier and they hit the brain. Specifically, when we're talking about adiposity, they hit hypothalamus. Hypothalamus, it's a very small area in the brain that will regulate the sensation of hunger and eventually our body weight. What happens, both of these hormones, they have their receptors that are sitting specifically in the hypothalamus and they can specifically tell these receptors, they, can, they will activate them and they will tell us that if we are in, in a proper body weight, they will tell us that we are done eating. We are not hungry anymore, and it's time to stop eating, to put it down. Once we become obese, we develop resistance to this hormone, specifically leptin. Leptic, leptin is a deposit hormone that is secreted from our adipose tissue in the proportion to our body weight. What happens when we become obese, when we start developing obesity, we are becoming resistant to this hormone. And while it is still secreted, appropriately at this point, if we're not really fat yet, it will still cross the blood-brain barrier, go to our hypothalamus, tell us to stop eating. However, we are already developing resistance to it. Because of this, we keep eating because we don't really feel this sensation that we're done. It, the signals didn't go properly down through the hypothalamic area. And when, once we didn't stop, what? first time, we didn't stop the second time, it keeps going on and it becomes sort of a vicious cycle. And this is basically one of the reasons we actually become fat eventually. So let's, um, yeah, I'm feeling really weird with this knife pointing. <laughs> so let's just talk a tiny bit in more details about the hypothalamus. So I said this is our area in the brain that is so crucial for us being sensitive to these to this hormones, for us knowing when enough is enough. 
So what we have here, this is the basic very rough structure of the hypothalamus. It has lateral hypothalamic areas, paraventricular areas that will eventually send these projections, this neuronal projection that will tell us when enough is enough. And here, the, these two circles here, these are the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus. In the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus, this is the third ventricle, so this is right like the edge of the brain, basically. In the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus, we have two very important neuronal populations that sense this leptin signal. We have the POMC neurons and the AGRP neurons. AGRP neurons, these are basically our orexigenic neurons. What is, and POMC, anorexigenic neurons. What does it mean? Exactly as the name says. Anorexigenic neurons will, tell you, will send the signals, will tell you that enough is enough. The opposite, anorexigenic neurons, will tell you, keep going, keep going. When your signals appropriately been regulated, leptin will sit on foam seal and tell when enough is enough. The opposite, when you, you are hungry, right? For example, if you're fasting overnight and you've been, or you've been fasting for a prolonged period of time, you need to activate your anorexigenic signals because you're hungry. And this is when you're supposed to know. This is how you know in your stomach, in your gut, you know that you're hungry because your signals through the AGRP neurons were activated. And this is basically when you, you'll feel that you, you want to start eating. When this signaling through the POMC and AGRP neurons, this orexigenic, anorexigenic balance is being disrupted because it's positive, because you keep eating and you don't pay attention to actually what your stomach is saying, when you, what your brain is sending to your stomach, to your other sensory, you know, organs to tell you that when it's enough, it's enough, you just keep doing it as a, as a matter of habit, this is when this whole circuit is being disrupted. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more in detail. So what do we know about obesity in general? There are many, many studies being done for over decades already that we know that obesity is basically characterized by chronic low-grade inflammation. And we know that when we're obese, we have inf inflammatory signals that are coming from our adipose tissue, that they interfere with our blood flow. We have tons of different inflammatory cytokines flowing there, IL-6, IL-1, IL-10, TNF-alpha, and so on and so on. And it's all been associated with obesity, and this is what's defined as peripheral obesity. However, in the recent years, what we also started to understand that there is such thing as sensory regulated inflammation, hypothalamic inflammation. And the, the cells in the brain, not only in hypothalamus, the cells, the cells in the brain that are not neuronal cells, they're inflammatory. Our immune system in the brain is, consists of different cells. So we have the, ast we have the astrocytes, we have the microglia, and oligodendrocytes. These, especially the microglia, these are the immune cells of the brain. These are the cells that in the, they have defined glia cells. So we have the neuronal cells and we have the glia cells in the brain. And in the brain, these cells are those that will secrete these same cytokines, the same as what we have in periphery. So they will secrete TNF-alpha, IL-6, and so on, as a response, as an inflammatory response. And there are many studies on what's going on when there is a sepsis, when there is a brain injury, and so on and so on. However, now we know that it's also associated with obesity. So it's not only obesity and low-grade inflammation in the periphery, it is also obesity and inflammation specifically in the hypothalamus as a response to these glia cells secreting these inflammatory factors. And Yes, there are many things about this hypothalamic inflammation that I want to talk later. However, we know that this, this leptin and insulin resistance that is coming by the fact that we are developing this reason, we don't respond properly to these factors, it will make our POMC and AGRP neurons not respond properly, as I said previously, and it will also affect our whole body glucose metabolism, the insulin secretion pattern from the pancreas will be disrupted, and the thermogenesis which is something that's called brown adipose tissue that we have here. And this is something that's healthy for you. This is how you basically become more thermogenically and more energetically. This will also be done. Now let's talk a little bit more about these cells. So, so it, it's been going on in the literature for quite a while, and we knew that something is going on in the brain in response to this obesity. 
and it was demonstrated by Michael Schwartz's group a couple of years ago that in mouse, so you know, how can you tell in you? you? You go for mouse first of all, right? So in the mouse it was shown that already 24 hours, 24 hours of really high fat diet feeding, so it's a really, really high 60% diet that animal is eating, you already have a huge boost of uh, inflammation in the brain, specifically in the hypothalamus. So what you see here, and we don't need to go to too much details, but chow, so chow is a regular diet that animal is eating. It's basically, it's basically 5% uh, calorie index, so it's a really low diet that animals are eating. And they are looking at several genes. So they are looking at GFAP, which is the marker for the astrocytes, one of these uh, uh, glia cells. They are looking at EMR1, which is the marker for the microglia, and the same for the CD68. So this is, again, another marker for the microglia. So these are the, these glia cells. Now, this is how the regular chow, this is, and these are the slide, the sections from the hypothalamus. So again, we're only talking about hypothalamus at this point. So the regular chow, you have these glia cells, right? You're supposed to have glia cells. However, glia cells are about 5% of the brain in general. So you're not supposed to have glia cells all over the place, right? This is one day that these animals were eating high fat diet. So imagine yourself basically sitting and eating two to three burgers in one day, right? That's basically it. And you can see here how hugely there is a jump in these markers of these glia cells. And this is the <laughs> and this is the picture of how one week after high fat diet, how it looks like in the hypothalamus. Is that a, that's a stain for glial cells? This is a stain. Yes, this is a stain for the astrocytes. For the astrocytes. For the astrocytes. One week after the eating of high fat diet of these animals, you see how huge is this difference. And yes, you can re yes you can reverse this progress, and it was shown that it was shown that if you know you keep feeding these animals really high fat diet and it's all up and inflamed and it's like really bad, but when you switch them back to the really low either calorie restriction or chow, you can actually reverse the process. So now we know it's bad, and we also know that it can be reversed with so so high fat diet leads to hypertrophy of the astrocytes yes. and growth of the astrocytes? Is it actually the growth? It's an interesting question. So it's basically astrogliosis. Yes, you do have the astrogliosis, you also have the microgliosis of mm -hmm. these glia cells. Uh, do they actually increase in numbers? Yes. I think it also depends on the area inside the hypothalamus where you, where you quantify. And I will show you later some of the pictures uh, because it depends. If you're only looking at the arcuate nucleus, it's mostly about their shape. So they really change their shape, you know, like regular glia cell, like astrocyte or microglia. They would look like, like you know, this would be the shape, right? When they become more inflamed, when they be, when it's called, what's called, what is defined as microastrogliosis, they will really, it will be the same number though. Mm -hmm. But these projections from the cell will be like much more defined. We just keep going to different directions. Yeah, yes, exactly. Is there is there um, uh, markers or whatever for the activity? Of so the cells that, that would demonstrate that, as well as them growing and proliferating, they're also doing other things too. Exactly. So most of the one of the biggest thing that they are actually doing, they're secreting these cytokines. In a normal state, microglia, for example, are not supposed to secrete. If they're not activated, because only activated microglia will actually secrete cytokines, these inflammatory cytokines, such as TNF alpha. So, if you actually want to know that, if, and I will show images exactly about this later of our own data, if you really want to see if this cell is activated, microglia cell, you're also doing stains for the TNF alpha in that same cell. And if you really see that there's tons of TNF alpha there, it's probably not something else that's going on with this particular cell. So. Does the ketogenic diet affect this? Where they eat the high fats, low carbs? So what they were eating right here, I don't really remember the, de the details of this high fat diet. This was 60% high fat diet. A, the different components, like if it's more ketogenic diet, and so they will, they will do it differently, yes. So it will matter. It will matter. And my guess would be that it matters how robustly and quickly the effect is. Because it's also something like, you know, if you, yes, if you give animal 60 or 65%, it just, you know, quickly jumps. But this is basically the matter of proof of concept that this is what's going on. And if you feed animal 45% high 
Haifa died. It will also happen, but much later and much less robustly right away. So, and this is basically the evidence of this gliosis that was done in human. So, you know, like an animal you can do one day, two days, every day basically hyper diet and just, you know, kill the animal, look at their brain and say, okay, whether there's something going on as a response to this dietary intake or whether nothing was going on, right? In a human you can't tell. Because animal, which is important to mention, for example, that animal one or even a week after high fat diet feeding, they're not fat yet. Nothing is going really, like visually you can't tell after one day of high fat diet feeding that animal is fat. It takes at least a couple of weeks until you see increased body weight in the animal. But you already see increase in microgliosis or astrogliosis in the brain. Now in human, it takes time, right? So in human, you actually need to take a really obese individual and then just do an MRI scan to really see whether anything going on. So this was a very rough um, study that was done again by biologists, so it's less uh, human, uh, you know, or uh, defined uh, study. However, what they looked here, they took a really obese man, and they, look, they looked at the evidence for gliosis, specifically in the MBH, which is medial basal hypothalamus. So again, they were focusing on hypothalamus. And uh, not that I'm an expert on the MRI scan, but basically what they were doing here, they said, okay, it shouldn't be that lighting up, and we just want to see the correlation between the BMI, between their body weight, and the hyperintensity of the signal in the hypothalamus. Basically saying that if it so lights up in the hypothalamus, we assume that these are the glia, this is the gliosis that is there. And then they measured it in some way that is, again, not part of my expertise, but... Based on their study, they said that, yes, we do see the evidence of gliosis in a really fat man, once we're looking specifically in the hypothalamus. So it's not only the animal model, we do see the same in humans as well. So let's just switch slightly from the obesity and, my, and mm -hmm. microgliosis, osteogliosis and hypothalamus, and our aging. So basically the same that is happening in obesity is also happening with age in animal, and in a human. When we age, we have what's called age-associated neuroinflammation, age-associated microgliosis and astrogliosis. And this is one of our old studies when we looked at hypothalamic gliosis, and these are the astrocytes again, in a very old mice that are 22 months old, so relative to human to be quite an old individual because mice live about two and a half years. So these mice were two years of age. And we compared this, we compared them to six months of age. Then we just saw you know, how it looks like specifically in the hypothalamus, right? And yes, we saw, so our picture from 22 months old animal sort somehow resembles what we saw previously from high fat diet fed animals after even a couple of days of high fat diet feeding. Yes, there is a huge amount of, like, of astrogliosis and also microgliosis going on in the hypothalamus of these animals that at this point they, went, they ate the same. So this is already age-associated uh, gliosis. So from biological perspective, what triggers this process of, this, of them to become more inflammatory? And there are studies uh, that I will be showing you next that were done by Don Chinkai laboratory in which they showed that specifically added kappa B signaling pathway, which is the pathway that is specifically responding to this and actually triggering the inflammatory cytokine production, the production of TNF-alpha, IL-6, IL-1, and so on. And this is just very, very roughly to show you that there is actually there are receptors that are being activated, they're triggering this whole cascade of IKK beta that eventually activates NF-kappa B, and this, is, will, this will trigger the, the production of cytokines, different inflammatory cytokines. Now, really surprisingly, it was demonstrated by Don Chinkai laboratory that when you specifically inhibit in the hypothalamus this inflammatory signaling pathway, so it's called, this is what you see here on, on the green, DN IKK beta alpha. It means that they just, it was, it's do, so it's dominant negative. Basically what they did, they blocked, they blocked this pathway, they blocked this step. And the animals in the hypothalamus specifically, so it was only done in hypothalamus, animals did not produce this signaling pathway anymore, it was blocked. So inflammatory pathway of INF-kappa B in the hypothalamus was blocked. When they did this in the, in the middle-aged animals, animals live longer. 
the opposite, when they overexpress this pathway, meaning that animals were really inflammatory, only in the hypothalamus. And this was defined here as OE, overexpressor of IKK vector. So they overexpressed this whole part. So it was really, really activated. When they did this, animals started to die much earlier. And this was published in Nature in 2013. So what this, in a very rough way, what this experiment showed, that specifically, we can specifically target inflammatory pathway in the hypothalamus specifically, and by this, we can modify the aging processes. So it shows you how important hypothalamus is and how important inflammatory pathways. And we, have, we said that inflammatory pathways are in these inflammatory cytokines are secreted from these glia cells in the MBH and medial basal hypothalamus, how important they are not only for obesity, but also for our aging, for our hormone pace of aging. And they had done tons of different studies also to show that it's not only about the health, the lifespan, which is obviously important, it's also about the health span. Because these animals, when they were very old, they also performed better in terms of their memory. And there are lots of different studies you can do on animals. You can test their memory performance, and they remembered better when they were old. They um, were exercising better, so they were physically better fit. So they sort of modified not only the lifespan per se, but also the health span. So these mice became better. Now, is, if this is something that is happening in general, right? So this was a very defined genetic model, right? But if it's so important, our, our inflammation, if our inflammation in the hypothalamus and this area of the brain is so important, then on other different animal models, and again, we're going back to animals, it should resemble, it should get the same effect. Because if it's something unifying for, and it makes sense, then it should make sense to other models as well. So what we did, what we wanted to test was what happens in other long-lived animal models. Is it the same phenotype? So here I'm showing you the data from, so in aging field there is what's defined the longest-lived animal model, basically. And they, these mice even got some prizes for living longer, forever and ever, basically. And they're called, uh, th these are dwarf mice, so they're small. And what they don't have, they don't have growth hormones at all. So these are gross hormone deficient mice. And they were generated already from many years ago and it's been shown in many different laboratories, many different settings, so it's like already as a fact basically that they live much, much longer, as you can see here, by black as compared to control in the months of age. So if you if you compare this to human, it will be kind of 30% increasing the lifespan. Quite major. So this is a very old-fashioned, long-known animal model of longevity, and they're called dwarf mice. They don't have growth hormone, they're very small, and they're very healthy. I mean, is it good for, for all of us not to have growth hormone? Obviously not. But in, a, in, in animal world, in this particular setting, you will just keep living and living, which is really great. So we said, okay, if this is the case, what what what, how their inflammation in their brain, specifically in the hypothalamus, looks like when they're old. Because we just said they live longer, they're really great, and you can modify this whole inflammation in the hypothalamus, and you can either live longer or not. So is it something that is specific, if this is unifying, that will be everywhere? So we, look, we took these animals, and here they are written as aims, but these are the same eyes. They just have different names occasionally. So we took these animals at two years of age. Again, we said it's pretty old. It's really old for the animal. So for human, it will be about uh, 75 to 80, something like this. And this, so you might just look at the graph, so you can look at the pictures as well. So this is basically fluorescent staining when you're, when you're staining for red. And red is the mark, it's, uh, it's staining the IBA1, and IBA1 is the marker for the microglia. So this is how you know that you're looking at the microglia. And green is TNF alpha. So as, and the merge is just basically how they look together. So as we said, and blue is the duck, which is just nuclear market. So as we said previously, uh, microglia are those that will be secreting this TNF alpha if anything, if they're inflamed, if they're activated, and of course, at two years of age, all of them will be at this point because we have what's defined as age-associated neuroinflammation at this point. So if, you're, if you focus on these slow panels, 
what we basically did, we quantified it and we looked how many of these microglia we have and how many of these microglia are actually secreting this TNF alpha at this point. And what, what we saw was, and, and we are looking only in the hypothalamus, so this is the third ventricle and this is the arterial glucose pulsation of the hypothalamus. And what we saw actually that yes, these long-lived animal models in a very old age have reduced microglia numbers. They actually have less microglia in them and they secrete much less TNF alpha. And I forgot actually to add an additional graph here, which was a percentage of how many mi percentage of microglia that actually secrete this TNF alpha as a percentage of the total numbers. And this graph is missing here, and I apologize. And it was also lower. So we had less cells that were actually secreting less. So yes, you had it here because these are old mice and eventually they will die. That's every human, you will die. But it was much less. So was it associated only with growth hormone? No. This is some sort of general phenomenon that is going on if, if something delays uh, aging. So we said, okay, is it, is it constant? I mean, is it something that can be reversed? So it was previously published by Andrew Barkey, our collaborator, that uh, this constant longevity of this particular mouse model that doesn't have growth hormone can be reversed. When? If you start injecting growth hormone in a very short period of time, there is this short window of development. During the first six weeks of life, if you start injecting growth hormone, only then, and then you just don't do it later. So only at the beginning of their life, you inject growth hormone for two weeks, and then you stop. Then you stop. Can you reverse the aging? Yes, you can. And they previously published it, and you can see here, so this is again our long-lived animal that was already, this is basically as a fact already in literature, they always live longer. However, when you start injecting them growth hormone in a very short period of time during their life development, which is already postnatal, after the animal was already born, you can reverse it and they will start living as controls. So you can basically reverse their longevity phenotype. So we said, ah, what's happening in terms of the neuroinflammation of these animals? If this is some sort of constant inflammatory thing that goes up and down, depends on their aging status, then this should also be reversed. And again, these are the same images of, uh, if, uh, if of the, our inflammatory studies. So we're looking at the hypothalamus, we're staying for TNF alpha as our inflammatory cytokine, and we're looking at the IVA, which is the marker for the microglia, and this already shows you everything. So you have your controls, you have your aims, which are these mice that don't have growth hormone. These are aims to sell just additional control. And these are these aims to inject the growth hormone very early in life, only this short period of two weeks of life. And it shows you that this thing was reversed. So yes, these animals live now normally as controls. And yes, in terms of the neuroinflammation in the brain, in the hypothalamus of these animals, it was also reversed. So you can basically switch this trigger and you can trigger this neuroinflammatory component as you wish, basically. So it's something that's modifiable. So taking everything that you just learned in this couple of minutes or half an hour or whatever, is it some, what do we know? We know that it's important, that inflammation in the hypothalamus is important. We know that it is important for obesity, we, uh, adiposity, development of insulin resistance. We also know it's important for aging. We also know that it can be modifiable. It can be triggered to some way, and it's not only about growth hormone, of course, but it's something in this very short period of time, because when growth hormone was, was uh, injected only in this short window of uh, postnatal development, which is it reversed this whole thing back. And I'm sort of skipping some of the other data that when we inject growth hormone in other periods of time, later in life or later postnatal in the animal life, none of this happened, nothing happened. The longevity wasn't affected and inflammation wasn't affected either. So it's only it was this period of time was so important. So then, sort of coming back to this particular slide, we say, okay, so then there is something about this early life that maybe is important for our aging, for our well-being, and for our later life development of neuroinflammation that is bad for us because, you know, it's something that triggers us to actually 
develop all these other diseases, and it can be also good for us, right? Because it can actually save us. So what is this link between this early life nutrition or early life processes, developmental process, and hypothalamic physiology and inflammation? So what we wanted to see, we wanted to see how important is this window, this short period of time for the, for the inflammation, for the, hyper, for the hypothalamic development. So what we did, we said, okay, uh, how can you interfere, how, what can you do with this, pro with this period of time? You can modify the diet, right? And uh, for the eggs, so what we did, and I, want, I will get back in, in a second to the human component, like what does it mean for the human, it's opposite to the mouse. So what we did, we developed what's called crowded litter model. What does it mean? It means that after the animal was born, female was feeding a little bit more than usual. So usually the female has eight nipples and she can feed eight, seven pups. We gave her a little bit more, we gave her 12 pups. So once they were born, she was feeding more. She has less nipples, right, from what she needs. So they were eating less and they were undernourished, let's say. In, in, in our world, it's, called, it's basically called early life caloric restriction. So in this period of life, when they, during their lactation, because they're only during lactation, once they're done, once she's done breastfeeding and you separate them from their mother, they are free to eat as much as they want. So only to this period of time, everything that we did, that the animals were eating a little bit less. So they had a little bit less milk. That's all. Now, what happened? So since I'm part of the geriatric center, and we said, okay, is this sort of short period of intervention, does it affect their lifespan because uh, there are many studies in human and in animals to show that caloric restriction regardless of when you start it it prolongs your lifespan and it makes you healthier so it affects your health span and your lifespan so we said before we even go into any more detailed studies does this short period of caloric restriction sort of does it affect their longevity and yes it does and you can ignore this one this was additional study that we had um, and which, which is previously published in 2009. So we just looked at their longevity without doing anything else. They were free to eat once they were weaned. Only in this short period of their postnatal development, they ate less. And these are the black are their controls, and the CL12, these are this crowded liter 12 so that the female that was eating, that was feeding more pups. You see that these animals live longer. These animals live actually almost 17% longer as compared to controls, and nothing else was modified in them besides them having less milk or eating less in the short window of time. Now, as if you, when going back to human, when you compare the animal short window, this postnatal life to compare to human, this is third trimester. This is our third trimester. That's it. So in the animal, development of the hypothalamus in the mouse is actually occurring in this P postnatal day uh, one to postnatal day 16. This is when the hypothalamic projection will be developed from the arcuate nucleus. Everything that I talked previously about their satiety signals, how the how these uh, are AGRP and HOMC neurons are being developed, and the, their projections to other hypothalamic areas. In the animal, it's all postnatal in the first two to three weeks of life. In human, it's all about the third trimester. This is when the final final. Project. So the factors of that would be things like obviously diet of the mother. Diet of the mother. Probably exactly. stressors. So this think. particular study only examines dieters, uh, diet as a stressor, but mm -hmm. there are other stressors, of course, that you know, will be stressors. No, but yes, this particular one is only about the diet. And and other whatever impacts that there might be in, in life that would change. I mean, I would think if somebody is. The reason I think of stress is because there are so many things out there that. Yes, no, no, absolutely. But this is about. why the mouse model is so is, is different. You know, in the animal model, you can mm -hmm. control. So you're saying you're asking only one question. You say, I want to only focus on the dietary factor. Of course, when you have a human, you cannot only s separate yourself from other stressors, such as environment and genetic component, and so and so. In the, 
but this is why it's also very difficult to say, okay, was it only the nutritional component that was so important for the later life development of the baby, right? In the animal, you can actually ask this question. And this is how it's so, you know, it's a very clean sort of, you know, setting. You're saying, okay, I have a very defined genetic background, so I know their genetics, right? There's a mixed background in a very defined way that we're using for other longevity studies. I know what they're eating. Now I'm asking one question. Is that this dietary component was so important in early life? So yes, you will have many other factors in the human that will come into the question that will modify this for sure five times to different directions. Depends, right, on the question or how many components you're entering into your equation, your statistical analysis, right? But this is why the mouse actually provides you this opportunity to see what happens only if the nutritional component was modified. So. Now, interestingly, so again, these animals were free to eat as much as they want, theoretically, from the point that they were weaned from their mother, right? However, what we saw, that these animals were always leaner. So they were used to get less from during this early postnatal life, and again, this is third trimester, the human, and they kept this. So they were always leaner regardless of their age. They were also more... A healthier from other perspective, uh, parameters, and I'm just showing you, you know, insulin just. Yes, they were more insulin sensitive. They always had lower insulin. They were more energetic when we tested all of the uh, energy capacity. They were more energetic. They were more active. But they were better. They were healthier, regardless of their age. And maybe this is also why they lived longer eventually. But it was all about this early life intervention that happened only during this short window of postnatal, early postnatal life. Life. So going back to the hypothalamic inflammation again, it was different when these animals were old. Was anything happening then? We know that already that these animals lived longer. So again, going back to exactly the same uh, thing that we did previously, we took two, or two year, almost two years old animals. We looked at their hypothalamus, and again we focused on the TNF alpha as. Uh, the inflammatory cytokine, microglia is in red, and this is basically the merge of both of them. So you can only focus on these graphs, and this is the uh, number of uh, microglia positive cells in these animals, TNF alpha, and this is the TNF alpha as a percentage of total microglia positive cells that these animals have. And as you can see here, that yes, this early short period of nutrient intervention specifically affected their neuroinflammation specifically in the hypothalamus and they had less so which sort of tells you again you know sort of proves the same point that yes not only how important is how can we modify this through nutritional component but also specifically tells that maybe this is partially the reason why these animals live longer so again remembering everything that we talked so far for, from human perspective uh, what sort of things can we take as a take-home message? What can we do, right? And were there any pharmacological interventions that can slow aging and can be important, you know, for really for us to live longer, right? So what are we doing when we're aiming, when we want to treat aging, right? And there are different interventions. So the biggest question, because we're talking about human at this point, so the biggest question we want to have is overall well-being, right? We not only want to live longer, we also want to live well while we live longer. So when we are, so we need to design a trial basically, right, to test how these interventions can delay the progression of aging and also affect some other components that are associated with different age-associated diseases and so on and so on. So there are many components that are part of it. And when we want to, when we are setting these experiments with, with animals, right, we want to see how they are Activity, different pathways, different pathways that are important. We want also to see it in multiple different animal cohorts that from different different cohorts in different places it does the same thing. So what was defined by the NIH is what's called intervention testing program, which I am part of. It is called I so we are called ITP intervention testing program. And uh, basically what we're doing is we're trying to choose at different drugs, FDA-approved drugs, 
that we think might be important for longevity. And of course, we're using animal mice as a model for this. So there are three centers that are being funded by, that are defined ITP being funded by an NIA for this. So we have the University of Texas in San Antonio, University of Michigan, and Jackson Laboratories. And there is also a setup at the NIA itself that are also testing some of these drugs. And what ITP does, it tests different diets, drugs, or any other interventions, and each one of you can actually come to the NIA and suggest an intervention that you think will actually extend lifespan if you have enough proof that you think that it actually works from your own data, from your own studies, and so on and so on. And they might approve this, and then it will be tested in all these three sites. So it's about 800 animals per site, which is huge. So when, any of, when all three of our sites are saying that this, that this particular intervention indeed extends lifespan, it probably does. This is bottom line, because the numbers are so huge and so many places are involved in exactly the same diet, exactly the same everything besides the Michigan air, even the water, we are all sharing the same. So it's probably there. So then the answer is right, because uh, as you guys probably know, there are many studies from different laboratories. We, some had a very small number of animals, some had uh, this, some had this. It's all different. You can never repeat it. Sometimes you can, sometimes you cannot. And it's sort of a mess. But here it's a very controlled, very unified setup, very unified model. And the number of animals is so huge that basically none of the investigators can afford it only by himself as one investigator. So it's really like a you know, large sort of cohort. So what are the key elements of this program? First of all, we want to use genetically heterogeneous mice. Why? Because we want this to be relative to human. And, you know, we are not, so some of these previous studies I showed you were done on the homogeneous genetic background. And here you want it to be heterogeneous. So we generated what we call three, three, three inbred cross from different components. And then we just keep going with this. And this is the same model for all the sites. Because you want it again to be as applicable eventually to human group as possible coming from the animal model from the animal, right? So again, as what I said previously, it's been done simultaneously in three sites. And uh, yes, anyone can suggest, any academic scientist can suggest any sort of intervention as long as he has enough data to prove it. And, you know, he'll be funded by the NIA for this as well as part of this. So he'll get like a small grant uh, for his own studies on this intervention in addition to what these three sites will be doing. So he will not need to repeat this study again. And the initial phase one for each of these interventions is that we want to see whether this agent actually has an effect of lifespan. Like we do nothing else. Now, like animal is not being touched, never ever. We have a separate set of technicians that are very, very, you know, well trained only to do this. So animal is not being touched, stressed, or anything. They like, like live in a very defined, like, sterile environment only, only to see if this intervention that usually comes in food, so it's not like something that's injectable. Intervention that can be in food or water that actually does something for their lifespan. And this will be the first, like, one, question number one, first of all. Does it do something for their lifespan? And then we want to see some of these changes in hormones, uh, in some of the inflammatory uh, um, components, and maybe something in activity, but only in a very non disruptive way to the animal. So, what were the agents that were tested so far? And I will show you some of this data later about some of them. So what's the trust of this ITP test over the years? And many of them you guys know, so it's not something that it's... So it's all supposed to be already FDA approved and having this data already that they're good or not. So the first cohort, a number of years ago, the aspirin was tested, didn't provide any effect on lifespan. NDGA was tested, and this is anti-inflammatory agent that I will show you some data later. Some other agents that were tested. That did. So only in red, this is where we got actually the effect of lifespan. Everything that was green didn't do anything, but was approved by the NIA to actually be tested. Again, some other components that were tested didn't provide anything, but in the cohort from the second round, we had rapamycin. And as you guys know, rapamycin is a mTOR inhibitor. It has its, uh, some of the cancer effects, some effects uh, on the uh, liver on the eyes and so and so yes rapamycin is one of the interventions that specifically very robustly extends lifespan 
both sexes, males and females, constantly in different cohorts, in different experimental settings. We repeated reprising again, and it again it repeated its data in terms of the lifespan. We also had resveratrol, that is a well-known now new component that is actually in the red wine. So drink red wine, and you might also live longer, at least you will affect your, and you will have some beneficial effects in your lifespan as well. Again, so resveratrol had a positive effect in our cohort. We had another uh, simple statin that did nothing. Next cohort, again, resveratrol was repeated. And again, repeated the data. So again, three sites repeating the same thing twice. So the number of animals, it's about 2,000 animals at this point that live longer. So it's a very robust effect with both so males and females. We had some green tea extract, but I have no idea who offered and why it was agreed, but it didn't do anything. Uh, curcumin, which is known to have its anti-cancer effects. It's also very good for our blood flow and so and so. We didn't see any effect on longevity. Uh, some oil. And that was it. Now, cohort number five that was done first time in 2009, we used uh, one of the things that I'll be talking in a couple of minutes is 17 alpha estradiol, which is the, the same as 17 beta estradiol, which is estrogen basically. However, estrogen you cannot give both to males and females, obviously. But uh, this one is a modified version, you can, it's alpha, so you can give it to both. It had lifespan effect, and I will show this in a second. Methyl and blue, for some reason, it was also part of it, it didn't provide any effect. Acarvos, this is also something that I will show in a second. So Acarvos, it's anti-diabetes drug that is on the market, and people can take it. it uh, the difference between Acarvos and another drug, uh, metformin, that is well accepted now in the field of diabetes that people take to reduce their blood glucose. So Acarvos works on reducing our glucose peaks that are coming from the gut. So Acarvos specifically reduces these peaks. So if you develop, if you're in the process of developing diabetes, once you ate the meals like what we had right now, your peaks of glucose from the gut will really start pushing high. And when you take Acarvos, it will just suppress it down. So the method of action is different from a well-established now metformin, but it is a FDA-approved drug that people sometimes take, and it is helpful. Again, rapamycin was repeated again, and it was again effective. So rapamycin was read three times. In the cohort six, we again repeated anti-GA, which is anti-inflammatory agent, and again it was good. So some of them, and now we have a cohort seven with some of the new stuff, including metformin. So if one anti-diabetes drug is good, there are other studies already in the field to show that if you give metformin, again, well-established anti-diabetes drug now, if you give it to animal, animals actually live longer. We don't have data yet, but this was already approved by the NIA as a large cohort study, also in, in Albert Einstein College in New York, to test this on clinical trial in human. Some with, so it has nothing with diabetes at this point. So it's not that you, take, you have diabetes and you take metformin. It is about you being healthy and normal and an older age and you start taking metformin as a matter of trying to extend your lifespan or your well-being at this point, regardless of your blood glucose, even if your blood glucose are fine. Because all these animals are fine, so they're healthy. It's not about their... So it's not you're treating the sick mouse. You're giving it to a healthy mouse. And excuse me, and within each of these cohorts, were all of the animals given that combination at the same concentration, or were they... Different, con yes. So rapamycin would try three different concentrations, mm -hmm. trying to go lower, and also later in life. So I didn't go into all these details, but yes, we, it was not just repeated as is. It was also done differently, meaning that, for example, for the rapamycin specifically, so first we started with four months of age, which I would say very young person, right? And the last cohort of rapamycin was to start the treatment at nine months of age for the animal. So nine months of age, animal is almost one year old. So it's middle plus individual. The clinical study that now started in Albert <coughs> Einstein for metformin, they're, they're starting, it's already for human. They're doing it in a much older people. I think uh, it's about 60 plus, I believe, because all their cohort is pretty old. So they're doing it in a, in a very old already setting. But our metformin is still on animals, so all our stuff are on animals. So just sort of very brief, and I have no idea even what time is it. I don't know when I'm supposed to. I have about five minutes. Okay. <laughs> So then just very briefly, so this is how this A-carbos, uh, I just want to talk very briefly about some of these drugs and to show 
just to bring you back to the inflammation in the brain, basically. So this is one of them. This is A-carbos. Again, as I said, it's an anti-diabetes drug used to treat type 2 diabetes in the market. You can get it. You get a prescription for this. What it does is slows the conversion of starches to, to sugars and blunts the rise of blood glucose after the meal. So uh, this is some of the data just to show you. So we, we, kept, we gave A-carbos to animals from four months of age and just let them be, right? We tested both males and females. So what did we see? We saw that this there is a longevity effect. However, males responded much better to carbos, and there was a 25% increase in their lifespan, which is major, it's huge. It's basically, if you eat anti-diabetes drug, such as carbos, you, you, you're a male or a man, you live much, much longer. Now, females hardly respond. It was 5% increase. And again, this is the data from all three sides. So the number of animals is massive at this point. Uh, another drug that I will show you briefly some of the data, 17 alpha estradiol. Again, it is considered to be a non-feminized estrogen because you cannot give estrogen to both, both sexes. And uh, it is defined to have a reduced affinity to estrogen receptors. However, it was shown that it can have an effect with the treatments such as neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer's, stroke, and so on. And there are some clinical studies with the 17 alpha estradiol as well. So this is our data from 17 alpha estradiol, and again, this is the data pulled from three sites. Again, so we saw a substantial effect on male lifespan. It increased male lifespan for 20, 12%, which is again quite large. However, it had zero effect on female lifespan. So it was more. It, so there was also a sexual dimorphism in terms of how these drugs work. So remembering this, what I just showed you, and you can just ignore this huge picture. I'm not going to repeat it. So you can just focus on the graphs. So what we did again, we looked at you know, hypothalamic inflammation. We took very old animals. They were again two years of age. You're supposed to have inflammation. We looked at the hypothalamus. We tested our controls. A carbos treated mice from four weeks and then just keep going, from four months, sorry, and then they just keep going. And the same with 7 5 diet. We compared now both males and females. So if this is a fact, if this inflammation specifically in the hypothalamus is so important, We'll see. Now, what else you're supposed to expect? You just saw the data on longevity. It affected males, it did not affect females. So what you want to see here, it's interaction. So basically, the question is, was the effect in terms of inflammation in the hypothalamus, and was this effect sex-specific? And the answer is yes. So when you look at a carbos and the interaction of P035, it means it was interaction sex, so the question that we did in our statistics was sex to drug, and the interaction was significant. Again, for the 17 alpha estradiol, was the interaction sex to drug specific? Because if you see only statistical component of the drug, yes, it affected on both, then it's not necessarily about the longevity, right? Because you only saw it about males and not females. However, if you see this sex to drug interaction, it means that sex also had an effect. So it was specifically associated with their longevity effect that we saw of these drugs. And we saw this on the microglia, and the same we saw for the TNF alpha. Interaction sex to drug was significant for males, and it was not significant for females. Again, here, for 7 type estradiol, it was significant for males, it was not significant for females. And there is also associated with the number, again, there is also a sexual dimorphism in inflammatory numbers, in the numbers of microglia in the brain, in the hypothalamus specifically, but I just don't have time to go into these other components. But yes, so it means that this drug worked, we saw it affected males, when we looked at the inflammation specifically in the hypothalamus, it, the correlation was the same. So both of these components are important. Is this is what... So it's not, is it only correlation or whether there is actually something that triggers this longevity associated effect? This is something that, you know, we will need to figure out later, I guess. So just briefly to show you, so we just saw two different drugs that do do this. Longevity and that we see this associated with neuroinflammation. Another drug that I showed you previously, NDGA. So this is not even a drug. This is basically anti-inflammatory agent. It, sit, it is part of the plan. So it's basically part of the herbal medicine. It used to be widely used uh, as food preservatives in different natural fibers, but then later in recent studies they showed it also had some hepatotoxicity component. So it was um, taken from the market. 
So maybe there is also an effect of the concentrations of this NDGA. How much of this are you actually giving? Because the, the concentration of NDGA that causes hepatotoxicity was pretty large, a huge. So it, it depends how much of this you're giving to the animal. Going back to the ITP data, so yes, so then going back to the ITP data, we tested NDGA in different concentrations. So we'll 800 to uh, 2500 to 5000, just to see whether that actually the concentration component. And as you can see here, again, each one of these concentrations, even if you're going very low on this NDGA concentration, you give it to the animal. The, the, this is the data on, on males. It brought statistical significance in terms of the longevity in all three is, um, concentrations. On females, none of them had any effect, including the highest concentration. So again, this is additional drug that had a sexual dimorphic effect. Only affecting males, unfortunate event, <laughs> but in a very specific, a very robust way in all three sites. So again, just since we don't have enough time, just ignoring the pictures and so on. Just going back to this, it was also composed, however, it's much important. So is it something that happened really late? And if we see it would way earlier in life, we would see specific effect of sex as well, it is possible. But the effect of drug at this point was very significant. Again, we are looking at the microglia and the TNF alpha. So, so just saying, just going back, like one step back, we saw different drugs, the FDA approved drugs, they extend our lifespan, at least in the mouse, they affect more males than females, they also affect inflammation, specifically in the hypothalamus, they make it better. A, what, can, what else can extend our lifespan? What other interventions are there? Now, the most robust and the easiest one is calorie restriction. Now, we're, and we're talking about 40% 40 40 reduction in calorie restriction. And this is like the most powerful so far, not genetic intervention. It extends lifespan in every single species that was tested so far, from worms, nematodes, flies, mice, rats, monkeys, uh, there are huge, very beautiful studies from the NA on monkeys and calorie restriction, and human. Again, of course, cancer, diabetes, and so on. Very difficult to maintain, almost probably impossible to have 40% the reduction in caloric intake constant, but it works. Now, uh, the effect of caloric restriction on both sexes, and it's what's shown in our site, I just didn't bring the data, it was shown in our uh, ITP site, and it was shown across all other laboratories, there's never any discrepancy about the effect of color restriction, it works. Now, the beauty about color restriction, it affects their lifespan regardless of when you started. You saw previously when I showed you the data on what happens when you put animals on a very short sort of color restriction through lactation, when they eat less, women as a third trimester, and any other color restriction intervention, regardless of when you started, if you started in the middle life of the animal, if you started later in life, even a very old age, it still makes it better. It affects the metabolic rate, it reduces energy intake, obviously, it reduces white adipose tissue, it may reduce inflammation, reduces age-associated diseases, even there are studies about the color restriction and Alzheimer's diseases, then cells function better, and this is just not a very good picture of how different are the lifespan on a regular animal and animal that was say, on color restriction. So very, very briefly, uh, we did the same thing. Again, took very old, two years old mice. They were on a color restriction, the same as before, and this is something that was shown by ITP, that color restriction extends lifespan on both sexes, very significant, already known. We asked the same simple question, does it affect the hypothalamic inflammation in a very old age? And as you can see here, again, now what do, what do you want to expect here? You see it on both sexes. So you will not see a, you will not see interaction between sex and drug, right? You want it to be affected in both. And this is indeed what you see. So the effect of drug, we call it drug at this point, right? Because everything we call drug, but this is basically color restriction. So we see very, very, very significant effect of the drug, of the this intervention of color restriction on both male and female, on microglia and on the secretion of inflammatory TNF alpha in the very old two years old mice. So it works, it really makes them better regardless of the sex, which is something we would expect. So sort of like summarizing this, 
yes, we saw that this reduced hyperplanic inflammation can modulate aging processes, and it is very much possible it also contributes to the increased longevity. Uh, yes, this is. I just wanted to briefly touch base on a recent paper that was just out uh, from Don Chinkai Laboratory, which is the guy that originally showed that you, he can modify hypothalamic inflammation in the brain specifically by deleting inflammatory signaling pathway and by this extending their lifespan and then when he overexpresses this they live shorter. So now what he did in his recent study, he said, okay, what else is involved in the aging process? This is basically a novel mechanism that's now sort of starting to pop out and this has to do with neuronal stem cells, again specifically in the hypothalamus. So what he did, he said, okay, uh, how the neuronal stem cells in the hypothalamus look like in the old mouse and then he saw they are basically going down with age and this is sort of the staining for the neuronal marker, you know, stem cells marker stops to in two months, 16 months and 22 months, so this is basically two years of age of the mouse and he saw it really, really reduced this marker and this was nesting, nesting is neuronal marker. So he saw the stem cells are down. Uh, then he did again. He said, okay, what happens when I take a mouse and I modify and I block this, I block this pathway, right? So I want to, he wants to induce it, right? So he, he blocked the neuronal stem cells at, at 250 days with some genetic modification. And this is his red. So these are cells that, that, the, that the pathway for the neuronal stem cells is blocked. He looked at their longevity and they live much less than control. So there is additional component here, not only inflammatory, but also in terms of the stem cells. So he also looked at some of the behavioral components. And uh, don't have time to get to this right now, but he saw that it's all about this. So the, the, the exosomes. So exosomes, it's like small vesicles, basically. Just just to define as our garbage that's been secreted. And this, this garbage is now not even defined as garbage. It's something actually very important that can be part of the biomarkers, actually. And they're secreted by the, these stem cells. So he said, okay, if these stem cells, if these neuronal stem cells in the hypothalamus are so important, and he thinks that this garbage that's been secreted from this, these exosomes are so important, what happens if I give it back to the animal? So he actually secreted, he extracted these exosomes from the stem cells and he brought it back. He specifically injected these exosomes from the stem cells to the hypothalamus of these animals in the middle age. And he said, middle age, well, four months. And he said, okay, what happens in terms of their behavior? Are they better? And he looked at that locomotion, uh, some other parameters, like coordination, treadmill, so basically how they can run. And he saw, and this is already 16 months Animals. So they are pretty old, right? 12 months, a year old, so they're like a year and a couple of months. And yes, they're of course down just uh, as with vehicle, right, with control. But when he brings back this uh, stem cells derived exosomes, they are sort of coming back to normal, like as younger mice. So he can actually sort of reverse and make them more younger, uh, looking younger, behaving, uh, more energetic and so on. So this is another sort of interesting component to this aging uh, study, this aging field and hypothalamus, that it's not only about the inflammation, hypothalamic inflammation, as a response to this, there's also a stem cells component, it's so important, neuronal stem cells, and whatever they secrete, it's so, you know, so essential for the control of aging. But again, this was never proven yet on any of our aging drugs and so on, so this is something, that, you know, if you will see this again on some other models, then it will make sense. So yes, so, you know, this is basically where are we going from now, like what sort of novel interventions, and we are looking for novel interventions all the time. And we have a new cohort now that started with some additional drugs that were offered, suggested to the NIA by different investigators. And now a large cohort started from uh, 2016, that uh, each cohort takes about three years because, you know, you you put animals live for two and a half approximately, you collect the data, if there is a longevity effect that they will give you even longer, you want to collect all this data to analyze the data to get to any sort of result and then do you want to repeat this data and so on. So the new cohort is, on, is already started and we will see if there are any novel interventions, whether any of the old interventions that we already know that have an effect from four months, what happens if you start it really late because from human sort of mind thinking, right? You want to start it late because you never care when you are 
teenager when you're even 40 you never care about your longevity or, you know when you, whether you live longer but when you're 70 or 80 then you suddenly do so what happens if you start any of these drugs really late right does it affect their brain does it affect their hypothalamus in the mouse you can actually test this and then you can really know and get some sort of you know answers in terms of moving forward and again majority of the drugs that we're testing are FDA approved so this is something that you can basically maybe buy in the store at some well maybe not a carbus but NDGA in a low concentration perhaps so this is something that can actually be applicable right if you take a pill when you are 70 or 80 and it actually makes you better so this will be a cool thing so that's it, just uh, to uh, acknowledgement, so Richard Miller and Miller Lab members as part of the uh, ITP study with whom I collaborate, Andrew Bartke that uh, contributed the growth hormone deficient animals originally, uh, some of my lab members that were involved in some of the neuroinflammatory stuff, and uh, our findings, that's it, thank you.